it's a long day for you, right? Because yeah. you've got a, a keynote speech at three two or something. Keynotes. Two oh, keynotes, keynotes today. Uh, wow. Mm, and three interviews. <laughs> and like two meetings. A long time. And what and what's the sleep? <laughs> uh, sleep? Sleep for eight hours. It's, it's good. <laughs> that, that's There's great. no jet lag. It, it would be terrible if I am jet lag, but I don't have jet lag. Um, so this is good. You know, I do hate okay, jet lag. I, right. I just back from New York and that's, right. that's really terrible. <laughs> yeah, like like twelve or eleven hours. It's really okay. 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 All right. We're going okay. to start with um, the first question. Uh, time. How how would digital transformation currently drive Taiwan economy mm -hmm. in your point of view? Absolutely. So in Taiwan, uh, we have broadband as human right. Meaning that anywhere in Taiwan, no matter how remote it is, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, it's my fault. And our 4G unlimited data connection is about only 15 US dollars per month. And so this is one of the cheapest anywhere in the world. And because of that, we're seeing a difference in the patterns of the economy. Previously, because of transportation, because of broadband connection, uh, people tend to concentrate on the largest municipalities. Taipei or Kaohsiung or Taichung, right? right? But now, uh, because of broadband connection and the free, almost free uh, 4G connection, people are much more willing to work in the satellite cities or even back to their homes in the rural and indigenous areas because what previously required maybe dozens of people to start to form a local social enterprise or a collective and uh, things like that. Now most of them can be still in other cities with only one or two key people going back to that locality. So we're seeing a much more uh, equal uh, growth of the cutting edge technologies. For example, self-driving vehicles that may be a good to have or nice to have in large cities, but actually drone delivery and things like that are very, very useful in rural areas and even in remote islands. So all the newest digital emerging technologies are actually the first useful and must to have, not just need to have, in the uh, most excluded places. And once these places serving as kind of like sandboxes to prove for a year that these emerging technologies can really solve a local issue. For example, with the aging farming population, the farmers really need drones to help them to, to do spraying or to do other maintenance or robotic maintenance of their fields and things like that. And if things really work like this, they can then spread out across the world, but also to other regions in Taiwan. So I'm seeing uh, a really radical transformation in the regional revitalization enabled by the new technologies. Mm. Uh, you just mentioned uh, Taiwan got uh, the cheapest unlimited data connection. One of them. Yeah. Uh, how come? Because in Thailand, we are waiting for 5G technology and the, the cost of, of serving internet in Thailand is not that cheap. And, and how could Taiwan do that? Yeah, I think that's because we have broadband as human right as kind of the topmost uh, political. Um, so there's no president that would go against broadband as human right. We have a constitutionally protected uh, education budget. And everybody is very uh, much aware that if uh, the students in the rural or indigenous places don't have access to broadband internet, their education suffer, and they cannot learn from the best uh, in other places in the world. It will create a digital divide, not just economically, but also culturally as well. They will feel excluded uh, from the you know general population. And so because of that, I think it is a strong political will across all the different parties uh, about making the internet access as uh, fair as possible and as uh, affordable as possible. I think that's a result of this um, um, idea of just people who are telecom operators have this societal duty to take care of the places where it doesn't even make economic sense to operate. But once they're kind of uh, convinced to operate there, that place will grow. Uh, right. And eventually, it will pay back, but it requires a very long-term thinking. Wow. So, so pol uh, political direction tremendously matter. Yes, I think Dr. Tsai Ing-wen said broadband is a human right when she was campaigning for the president. I like that it. really matters. I really like it. Um, the first, the second question: How does your government support start startups and young talents in terms of digital mm -hmm. inclusion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so digital inclusion, of course, means that no matter uh, which generation you're in, which background, which ethnicity, which field, 
uh, you're focusing, uh, one must feel that one can control the decision making around the technology that right. affects someone, right? This is what, uh, what we call nothing about us without us. So uh, in a few ways. One is that we offer, as I mentioned, a sandbox. A sandbox is something that you can challenge the national government on any regulations or policies and to adapt to an emerging technology. For example, there was no regulation for self-driving vehicles, but now there is a law authorizing anyone who thinks they have a regulation for a new self-driving vehicle. They can just write it as a proposal and try it out for a year. The same goes for fintech. For example, there was a proposal about using people's telecom bills to calculate the affordable loans that they can uh, lend instead of like transactions with the bank. And so it's an interesting way to essentially allowing telecoms to become uh, you know, evaluators of loans and credits. So especially that's for marginalized or young people uh, because they have to pay telecom bills anyway. <laughs> so they can calculate their credits this way instead right. of uh, relying on having a bank account before and things like that. And that is, again, there's no regulation for that. So they just write a, their own regulation and try it out for a year and so on. And so any startup can just do this year-long experimentation in the open while sharing the data with everyone. And so it makes sense only if you have an idea that really makes the society better. Because otherwise, by the end of the year, the society will think, oh, it's not a good idea. Uh, we thank the investors for paying the tuitions for everybody, right? So it basically combines economic innovation with social innovation. That is to say, your innovation, if managed to convince the municipality or wherever you're doing the test for a year, then we accept and your regulation become our regulation. So this is what we call regulatory co-creation, making the startups essentially also policymakers uh, by trying out. And we encourage as many trying out as possible because the quality of startups is very uneven, right? It's, it's a very, very long, thick tail, right? You, you don't really know where they will end up. So only by open innovation and a large amount of swarm like experimentation right. can we converge on something that really solves a social issue. So that's the first thing that we do, the sandbox. And the second thing that we do to encourage startups is that we uh, encourage them to identify their work uh, through the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. So, SDGs, yeah, right. Yeah, the, the United Nations Global Goals. And so we have a central registry, si.daiwan.gov.tw.si.taiwan for social innovation. So we encourage everybody to declare what their company or cooperative or association is trying to do. And we have the formula, what we call a mission, a market, and a measurement. So the mission is to make the world better in some way. Market is the service or product that you're in, uh, interacting with the society. And the measurement is the yearly report of the, how, what the benefit you have measured uh, that you have done to the society. And for any social innovation organization that are willing to provide these three metrics, we list them on this catalog and we encourage people to procure, to buy from it. If you buy uh, five million dollars of such social entrepreneurship products, I personally come out and give you an award. Uh, and so we integrate it, basically everybody who focus on the same social problem to form ecosystems by themselves. And we run the Asia Pacific uh, Social Innovation Partnership Award to encourage the most unlikely partnerships across the sectors. Uh, the first prize this year went to uh, the Second Dewa uh, Fashion Village uh, Lab uh, to upcycle their fashion industry waste into uh, sustainable products, upcycled products. And we also recognized Carrefour uh, Taiwan while working with uh, the cage-free chicken uh, in, the, in the associations to promote animal rights and animal welfare. Uh, and things like that. So it's the more unlikely the partnership is, the more highlight we, we do. And I write personally columns on um, Business Week Taiwan, on Apple Daily and so on, to highlight those common values despite different positions. So this kind of ecosystem building is the second thing we provide to startups with a social or environmental goal. Strong sandbox support and ecosystem. Yes, and social innovation ecosystem. Social innovation ecosystem. We, we know that regulators and, and innovators are fighting all the time, all around the world. And how could Taiwan government deal with regulatory limitation in order to, how could they say, efficiently drive the economy? Right. We cannot regulate something that we don't have first-hand experience of, right? That is the whole idea of sandbox, is that we see it in action 
for a year. And then we decide what to do with it. So this kind of, kind of uh, co-experimentation or co-design of norms, I think is very important. Uh, if self-driving vehicles come to Taiwan and say, oh, I want to just have you know, some road to drive, it's okay, of course, if it drives slowly, if it goes in a way that's cause maximum you know, um, comfort uh, around this population. But if they just go and just hop on the main street and the main highway and an accident happen, right. that would actually drive exactly the conflict you saw on the regulators and the innovators. Right. So having a safe space dedicated to experiments, everybody who steps in understand they are in an experimentation zone and have the experiment start with data sharing. That actually is the key to make sure that the regulator uh, developing rec tech and uh, innovators developing fintech or other agriculture technologies to, can talk eye to eye on the same facts. And so if you cannot measure something, you cannot digitize and you know, make decisions about that with evidence, it will be about personal superstition. Yeah. So I, I actually using sandboxes and using experimentation fields, everybody can then see the same evidence and then start a rational discussion around the feelings uh, about the same facts. All right. Um, as a digital minister of Taiwan, we know that um, blockchain is back on the news. We know Facebook li Libra or Library, and we couldn't pronounce it. How do you think about that? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, in Taiwan, we say distributed ledger technology or DLTs. We use that already in our everyday public service to make sure that people who measure air quality by themselves, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency, can uh, work on each other's data without tampering each other's data because it's written to a shared distributed ledger. Um, we also have very quickly uh, SDO regulation that makes sure that equity-based crowdfunding can use the newest crypto vehicles to make sure that everybody stays accountable in their securities, due diligence, and things like that. And so I think we're very progressive when it comes to using technologies to further the social good, but that is with the uh, aim to further the public good. If the regulators think that something is uh, detrimental, has negative externality to the social good, they may ask the innovator to prove that it's actually positive to the society in an experiment for a year, right? So that is basically the regulator's device. It's not we designing the strategy for crypto or things like that. It's that we being humble and say, you know, I don't think it's a good idea, but you have a year to prove me wrong. That is the basic attitude that we're taking here. Do you really believe that in the next decades, our world will have only one single currency or something mm -hmm. like that? Do you believe such thing? Well, I mean, uh, I think part of the promise of blockchain is that everybody can design their own currencies and their own markets. Uh, for example, Ethereum is not a currency by itself only, right? It basically enables the different innovations of right. smart contracts right. that essentially create its own currencies. So I think the, the right to mint uh, alternative currencies, but also the technological underpinning to make sure that the innovations happening on one currency can carry over to the other currency. That is uh, what is important and also why uh, the Ethereum community is now working on market design and mechanism design uh, with Clang while and retro exchange and things like that. I think that gives people a different take on economics because the economics was too constrained uh, on a central uh, currency and a central market regulated by central bank. But right. people are now starting to see <clears throat> that anything that can be digitized can be a market. And once it is a market, market design, mechanism design can enter into the, the foray and make sure that people uh, play fair and disclose their private preferences in a way that are best for the public good. So for example, in our presidential hackathon, uh, we use quadratic voting and right. that came straight from the Ethereum community um, to make sure that people who vote on the cases that get our three months um, coaching uh, end up demoing to our president and the president give five winning team a trophy. The trophy is a presidential promise that if you turn on the trophy, which is a uh, presentation device, right. it projects the president's image handing the trophy to you. And that is a promise saying your idea in the three months prototype will become public policy by the next year. So we maintain that indefinitely for you. And so this kind of public sector innovation is also affected by the market design mechanism design right. in the form of quadratic voting. And so I think this everything uh, that is aimed of the currency design 
is actually uh, made possible by the newest technologies and not the over concentration of one single currency. But it gives our one single language to talk about different currencies. One single language yes. in the digital world, right? In the digital world. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And let's imagine together. Oh, I've got oh, fifteen minutes left. Mm -hmm. I left. Um, how could you imagine the world in next ten years? Mm -hmm. How could blockchain and AI significantly change the workforce, the business landscape, and our daily life mm -hmm. in, in Asian countries? Yeah, well, I think one of the best thing about those emerging technologies is that it enables, as I said, a location independence. Uh, the problem of transportation usually limited the different development potentials of different areas. But once you can have access to education, to medicine, to drone delivery, to all, uh, entertainment, whatever, uh, using broadband in 5G alone, uh, then that, that actually creates an opportunity to a much more fair um, development opportunities uh, around the world and in different regions. You are not uh, as uh, limited by the physical transportation options. You can actually get a full education, a best university or college, even if you are in the most rural of places. And so I think that will transform the workforce so that people understand uh, the repetitive skills, the skills that people usually associate individual competition to, those will be automated uh, away. And so there is less emphasis on individual competition mm -hmm. in the school, because that's an artificial um, thing, right? <laughs> that is artificial. Uh, competition between groups may be still existing, but competition between individual in the same group, that is going to go away because anything that can be simply measured and linear, and like I run a little bit faster than you, these things, like the robot will run 10 times faster than us anyway. <laughs> so anything that can be precisely measured as a basis for individual competition will be automated. And so I think people will become much more pro-social in the sense that we spend most of our time working on the human values of autonomy, of interaction, of developing a common good, and things like that. And the uh, you know repetitive skills, the competitive skills, actually is the realm of machines. I think that is the direction we're headed. Right. Uh, nowadays, we we know that everybody goes mobile. Mm -hmm. Talk that uh, statement all the time. And any recommendation for for the uh, business mm -hmm. to to get through this mm -hmm. transformation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So I think the mobile makes it possible for people to integrate the experiences in their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. People used to talk about user experience, assuming that the user is uh, exclusively interacting with one single business at a time. <coughs> it's a more transactional view. But actually, now we talk about the human experience, right? right? Uh, you, at any given time, may be interacting with different businesses and different associations, different entities. Once you go mobile, you're not uh, trapped in the front of a computer, right? You're walking around, you're swimming, you're doing all sorts of different things while interacting with the different uh, entities around you. And so I think that would cause for a more coherent design uh, that is more holistic in nature, that involves much more participation from the human uh, that are not only consumers, but actually creators of the experience. Right. So the more room that the companies can have on their uh, relationship with their customers to make them essentially stakeholders and co-create the experience, the better it will become. We see it very early on with say, Flickr, right? Making the photography a social object that people can comment on each other's photos and things like that. That was in the very, very early days when people call it Web 2.0. Right? But nowadays, I think the mobile technology enable we have essentially not web 2.0, but life 2.0, <laughs> where sure. we constantly interact with each other in a myriad of ways. So the more inclusive and the more uh, stakeholder driven it is, I think the, the more prosperous we are business be. Are you social media addicted? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> really? Do you, do, you, do you have Facebook account or do you Instagram. really take Selfie, a selfie photo or something like that? I, I do have Facebook accounts, but I install a browser extension called Facebook Feed Eradicator that took the feed away. And so I use Facebook mm. as a browser, right? I look for something, I search for something, I go to someone's profile, I watch a live stream, I use messaging, I use all this, right? But I don't have the feed 
which is the only part that sells addiction, that manufactures addiction, because that's the only thing that's unpredictable in Facebook. Mm-hmm. Everything else, you do something, you expect to see something, right. right? But it's only the feed that you don't know what will come. But is it is it interesting that? Oh, how how is my aunt's life right now? And my close friend, how are they? Also, they don't you, you really you really don't know that, right? Uh, they they will tell us if they think uh-huh. it's important for me to know. Interesting. Yeah. Do you believe that um, there would be another platform, or how could they say life after Facebook era or something mm-hmm. like that? Well, Facebook itself is changing, right? Uh, sure. Zuck said you know, that. Uh, he is also taking the timeline away, right? <laughs> so maybe we were uh, prototyping for him. But in any case, um, the Facebook is going into more of the way of Slack. It seems uh, they already made the interface change in their uh, workplace by Facebook product to make it much more Slack-like, much more concentrated on groups and sharing inside the groups, and even someday you know end-to-end encryption in groups, just like uh, in the line messaging system. So I think Facebook is definitely going that way. They call it future is private, right? right. <laughs> uh, private groups, I'm sure. But uh, what I'm seeing also is that um, Facebook has to make this change because people's idea of what the online life is uh, has changed. After a few years of working with timeline, people understand that the value that you put in, the time that you put in, right. uh, is actually far more than the value you get out of it, and and that makes it the same shape as a company that sells addiction. Mm-hmm. And, and that doesn't last long because our mental um, facility get adapted to it and we need stronger and stronger stimulus right. to stay addicted. So it's not a sustainable business model and Facebook knows that. And so I think even the product itself would get changed in a way that is more pro-social and less about just selling idle uh, addiction. Uh-huh. Do you really trust Mr. Zuckerberg? I haven't met him. <laughs> it's a great answer. Yeah, yep, you know. Um, when the teacher, when you was 15, uh, you you left the school, right? right? And and you mentioned that they all agree. Yeah, they all agree. Uh, and allow you to hey, yeah. just get out of the school and live and your start, life. Yeah, and, and start learning on the world web. Yes. Do you think why they agree? Because in our culture, Asian culture, education and, you know, certification is really crucial for our life, but, mm-hmm. but why I agree? A few things, right? First, um, I already, because I won first place in the junior school science fair, I'm already guaranteed to a senior high school anyway. So uh, no matter I go to the school or not, uh, I can get into the top senior high school if I want. It just turns out I don't want, right? So to the teachers, I'm more of a, a peer to them of kind of the same age adult to them because I can make my own decisions. I already have a guarantee of senior high school, whether I use it or not. And I argue it uh, in a very precise way saying, you know, the end goal that the teachers tell me is that I can start doing research on AI, cognitive science, linguistic or whatever in the top lab. And they thought that you would take 10 years to maybe get a GRE, get overseas, get Mm -hmm. admitted to a lab, doing postdoc work or things like that. But I show them, you know, I just emailed the author of a very popular, um, you know, scholar and they don't know that I'm just 15 years old and we just start collaborating together. And so I show them that the end point can be very easily reached without going through the the rituals uh, in the certifications for 10 years. And so after seeing that, I mean, they're all evidence-based people, right? (laughs) They saw the evidence of me just collaborating with scholars around the world on the archive community and they're like, yeah, maybe, you know, this new technology, but it makes sense. So you can leave your school if you're good enough? No, if Am you right? manage to convince your teachers <laughs> using the language that they easy use, at all. using the language that they use is always important. I see. Uh, now we are living. Some some people say we are living in platform economy. Mm-hmm. We know the live application. We know Amazon. We know we are excited all the time when when Alibaba launched mm-hmm. some new features or new business model. Mm-hmm. What do you expect for the next economy or, or any business landscape, landscape in the next digital era? Mm-hmm. Right, I think we haven't exhausted uh, the potential of platform economies. The platform economies uh, to this point are mostly privately owned with a few exceptions like Wikipedia, right? And so I think what we are going to see is the democratization of platform builders. It used to be very difficult to build a scalable large platform 
right? And so the people who have the concentrated powers uh, of capital, of human resources, are mainly the ones that take care of the largest platform. But that trend is actually changing. We see more and more people going to Discord to, uh, to have a chat. We see more and more people setting up their own chat servers. Uh, we see more and more people going back what we call a re-decentralization of the web. The web starts decentralized, then it becomes centralized, and then now it's re-decentralized. And so just having those uh, different platforms used by large open source tools and contributing their know-hows to the wider community enables through open source a different configuration of platforms on people who value their own control of their own platform lives. And so I think uh, like Mass Hodon, for example, uh, took off when nobody expected to. <laughs> but I think people really uh, have not exhausted the potentials of a community owned, of a collectively owned, of a cooperative platform. We're now seeing mostly the potential of privately held platforms, but this kind of social sector platforms, I think we're just starting to see the beginning of it. And of course, equity-based crowdfunding, SBO is part right. of it. Uh, Tan, are you, are you afraid of Alibaba's move? Mm -hmm. Which particular? <laughs> um, and, and actually, every element. But uh, some people in Thailand, they are afraid of something that could dominate our life mm -hmm. or manipulate something in mm -hmm. our life. Yes. In, in platform mm -hmm. economy. Do you really think? I think so. Right, so just as with the last century's uh, consumer awareness campaign, many consumers at that time did not understand they have uh, protected rights when it comes uh, to uh, counterfeit goods, uh, to products that are under quality and things like that. So uh, a massive education campaign is done so that consumer understand the legal right that they have against uh, the you know people who uh, sell the quality um, of products that are subpar, right? But now in this century, what we have is essentially privacy laws. And the GDPR, for example, from the Europe, uh, guarantees that people have the right to ask for a copy, to ask for update, deletion, portability, and things like that. But GDPR is empty if the people don't know how to use it. It gives us a broad swath of rights. But if those rights are not exercised, they're, they're nothing. And Taiwan, uh, being a, a jurisdiction that is following the Europe tradition of Privacy Act, and I understand Thailand is going to our same direction as well in a year, right? <laughs> and so I think what's most important is that the general population understand no matter how large the platform is, they actually is subject to the data fiduciary duties. The duty is that if I trust my data to you, right. you must use it in my best interest. And I can ask for an account, accountability, of whether you're actually using it for my best interest. It's just like a relationship with your lawyer, your accountant, your um, psychiatrist, right? If, if you're, uh, they are not acting on your best interest, you're free to take your business elsewhere. Right. And the state must guarantee your right to take your business elsewhere without too much fanfare and too much hassle, right? And so all this is protected, of course, by the GDPR framework. And even in the Privacy Act framework before that, but very few people actually know how to exercise this right. So I think what we need to focus on is just this general idea of education campaign and also making sure that even primary school students learn through the air boxes, for example, a personal measurement of air pollution and mm -hmm. um, producing data. Right. So everybody become data producers and everybody learn the data stewardship. And it's only when they are in the position of the data operator do can they actually understand what those duties are and why they're important, and then they can demand the same for right. the large platform companies. Right. We're coming to uh, last couple of questions. Uh, we would expect that technology should help create world peace or make our day better, something like that. But as we see today in, in the uh, trade war mm -hmm. between US and, and China. Mm -hmm. Seems like technology is one of the most important reasons mm -hmm. for causing that. Mm -hmm. How do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think technology doesn't solve problem or cause problem, right? People solve problems and cause problem with technology. Right. Uh, and technology is useful whenever you can measure something. If you can turn something into numbers or structured data, technology allows you to act on it. But for things like the conflicts uh, in the human society, sometimes it's not quantified at all. Sometimes there is no numbers behind right. it. 
sometimes it's just ideology, right? And so for these things, there's very little that technology can do to help, which is why I think we should develop more social technologies that allow people to see common values despite their difference in positions. In that sense, the Sustainable Development Goals is an important social innovation that give people the numbers to talk about it, right? I can say I'm the digital minister, I'm focusing on goal 17, 17, 17, 8, 17, 6, and so on, and this become kind of common language and index that we can then focus our cooperative frameworks on and partnerships on. Without those social technologies, I think just by capitalistic technology alone, we can, of course, fix some problems, but it will also cause other problems, and it may just cancel each other out at the end. So a social technology, in addition, to the industrial and capitalist technology, I think is the key to address the common problem that we have. You once say you you don't work for the government, but you only work with the government. Right. And today, uh, Andre Tang works for? No, I work with the government. <laughs> There's nobody you work for? No, of course not. Yeah, I, I don't take orders and I don't issue orders. I take suggestions and my ideas. I give my opinions and ideas. But it's always on a voluntary basis. Every ministry can choose to send one person to my office to learn together. But they rank their, their own store. They plan their own work. Uh, the only thing I ask is that they work out loud, meaning that they let the people see what they're working and earn their trust by trusting the people first. Impressive. And what is the, the most scary thing for you? Mm. Or what, what are your concerns today? No internet access, um, economic crisis, trade war, World War Three, or the upcoming fierce platform or something like that? Mm -hmm. okay, what I are think, your concerns? Yeah, really concerns yeah, today? I think my, my main concern is that people stop listening to one another. Uh, the technology make it very easy for people to broadcast their opinions. Um, it starts from radio and then television, right? Uh, so it's too easy to speak to a million people. And that caused arguably the World War II. Uh, and then uh, internet starts with the promise that you can now listen to millions of people together. And that millions of people can listen to each other. But it's just a possibility. If you don't exercise that possibility, if you use the internet only to broadcast your ideas without listening to, to any ideas, then actually it causes fragmented tribalism in the human society. Mm -hmm. And each one, of course, has their own populist ideas that appeals to those tribes, but it actually doesn't make sense for the general population. So I would argue it's not true populism. A true populism talks with the whole population and listens from the entire population I think that is the goal that we should aim for. And if we cannot gather, if people get uh, you know, trapped in their virtual realities and stop listening to one another, then we have a real problem because then we don't have a society anymore. I love that. I love that. Last question. What would you like the world to recognize you, the extraordinary genius geek or super, super um, transgender minister or any kind of... Mm -hmm type of people you, you want the world want, uh, to, to recognize you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I call myself a conservative mm -hmm. anarchist. Conservative means that I want to preserve the traditions mm -hmm. of different cultures, and instead of destroying them, to incorporate them. Right. Anarchist means that I don't give or take orders, that I want people to join through horizontal peer-to-peer -peer collaboration rather than horizontal commanding uh, relationship. And so, yeah, if the world remembers me as a conservative anarchist, I will be very happy with this. That's really good. And time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is really impressive.